Hello, it's Reverend Chris Taylor. Welcome to the feast on May the 1st in the Anglican calendar of St Philip and St James the Less. I'm going to take you through what we know of St Philip and of St James the Less and I'm going to start with St James the Less. What do we know of St James the Less? Well, the clue is in his name. What we know is that he was a disciple of Jesus, uh, one of the twelve. And beyond that, not very much, other than that he wasn't St James the Great, uh, who was one of Jesus's fab four, uh, who were with him often at key events uh, in his short ministry. St James the Less celebrated with St Philip on May the 1st, or May the 3rd in the Roman Catholic calendar. Then we come to St Philip. Now St Philip is an amazing chap. We hear a lot about St Philip in the Gospel of St John. Uh, it's, it's really interesting some of the things that he uh, illustrates and enables and we're going to look through those now. The first time we hear about St Philip is when Jesus calls him uh, along with uh, Simon and Andrew down in Bethsaida by Galilee. Now what happens is he's called and a bit before the story of the call of Philip Jesus is um, spoken to by a couple of disciples of John the Baptist who are a bit curious about what he's doing and Jesus just goes come and see come and see what I'm doing come and see where I am this evening and hear me preach and teach and then seven verses later in that same chapter one Philip says to his friend Nathaniel uh, to his friend Nathaniel who is doubtful about who Jesus is he says well don't take my word for it come and see so Philip right at the start of John's Gospel is offering that welcome that hospitality that invitation to come and understand a little more about who this man this itinerant rabbi this possible Messiah who he is and what he's about and of course Nathaniel takes him up on it and becomes another uh, apostle so that's St Philip right at the start of John's Gospel. Then a little later, uh, about five or six chapters on, Jesus feeds the 5,000. This is a really nice story and there's a bit of humour in it. I can almost imagine Jesus with a glint in his eye when he sees this vast crowd um, descending on him, wanting to hear him preach, see him cure the sick and heal the lame. Um, I can imagine uh, a sparkle in his eye as he looks around and his gaze settles on Philip and he says well how on earth are we going to feed this hungry multitude now obviously when Jesus speaks of feeding it's not just food it's a broader spiritual feeding as well but in this instance Philip hears him and you can see Philip scratching his head and going well Lord hmm let's have a look mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I reckon that'll take half a year's wages now I don't think he plucked that out of the air because I looked at what our average wage in the UK is and the average wage in the UK per annum is around about £30,000 slightly more and half of that is £15,000 now if you divide 15000 by 5000 you end up with three quid now three quid will get you uh, a chip dinner um, not fish and chips these days but it might get you uh, chips and a burger it might get you chips and something else. It'll certainly get you a sandwich and a soft drink or a sandwich and a bag of crisps and a soft drink if they've got a special offer on. So three quid is quite a good um, working, uh, working number to get a snack for one of 5,000 people. And so I think Philip did a brilliant job um, doing the maths. But of course, Jesus knew what he was gonna do. Uh, and he was just, as St. John tells us, testing Philip. The next time uh, that Philip crops up is at the festival of the Passover uh, just before the Last Supper and the whole of the Passion narrative. Now Jesus has made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. There's a whole load of conversation and chitter and chatter and a gossip about who he is and what he's going to do. 
and some Greeks are at the festival too. And they go to Philip, the disciple, because Philip has a Greek name, or that might be why. So they feel more comfortable dealing with someone who's got a name uh, that they can recognise. And Philip then goes to Andrew, and Andrew and Philip then both go to Jesus and tell him that there are these Greeks at the festival who want to speak to him. And Jesus then, I'm just going to go and check this, so, I, so that you can actually hear exactly what Jesus, uh, John reports Jesus as saying. As soon as Andrew and Philip tell Jesus, Jesus answers them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies it bears much fruit. So there we have Philip again offering Jesus the opportunity to teach around the idea of what Jesus knows is his forthcoming death uh, and resurrection. So again, Philip in the Gospel of John, uh, speaking words of truth and portentous words that prompt Jesus to make a statement about his forthcoming death. We next encounter Philip at the Last Supper now, it's a very familiar passage. It starts with Thomas saying, well, Lord, you tell us you're going somewhere. We don't know. We don't know where you're going. How could we know the way? And Jesus has a little bit of teaching there that goes on um, that he shares with all the disciples and then and, and talks about being with the father. And then, <laughs> then Philip, bless him, he pipes up, Lord, show us the father and then we'll be satisfied. Well, you just imagine Jesus absolutely frustrated at this stage, just before his passion, just before the end of the story, if you like. The disciples have been with him, well, how long have you been with me? Three and a half, four years? You still don't get it? If you know me, you know the Father. How come you haven't worked that one out, Philip? But again, Philip offers Jesus the opportunity to do some teaching on the nature of God and the nature of Jesus's relationship with God. And that's really helpful stuff, uh, even if he does it accidentally, if you like. And that's the last time, really, that we hear about Philip in the Gospels. Uh, we know that he was one of the disciples in the locked room when Jesus appeared uh, and we know that he was around with the risen Jesus um, following um, the resurrection. But what else can we tell you about him? What else can I tell you about him? Well, as far as we know, he preached and taught in Greece and Phrygia and Syria. And we also uh, think we know that he was killed, martyred in Hierapolis, which is part of modern day Turkey. And there are two stories. There is one that he was crucified upside down and there's another one that he was beheaded. Now, I can't tell you which is which. I can tell you also um, that he is the patron saint of Cape Verde, of hatters, of pastry chefs, of San Felipe Pueblo, which is a small settlement in New Mexico, and of Uruguay. I have a wonderful picture of him here. It's a stained glass. I hope you can see it. But if you see, he's carrying the word of God in one hand and a basket of what looks like loaves because of, I guess, the loaves and fishes story. Uh, and that might be something to do with him being the patron saint of pastry chefs as well. So that's what we know about St. Philip. And what I'm going to do is a little reflection now about what it must be like to have been that close to Jesus. Both James the Less and Philip were close followers of Jesus. Philip had a major role um, in enabling Jesus to fulfil certain parts of his call and also to teach uh, the disciples uh, new things about him that maybe they should have known but didn't. And I wonder what our call is when we're following Jesus, when we're trying to be true disciples. We try so desperately to understand Jesus's words 2,000 years ago in today's contexts. 
Sometimes we only understand them as they appear 2,000 years ago and we try and force them to make sense to us today. But what we do know as a result of St Philip's interventions is that it takes three quid a head to feed 5,000 people, which is good news. But more that as soon as there was a public announcement that Gentiles wanted to meet with Jesus, I think that was a signal that the teaching and the ministry had accomplished what it set out to achieve. It wasn't only a ministry to the Hebrew nation, it was also a ministry to the world and the world was beginning to hear about it and people were seeking to find out about Jesus. And what that is then, that's the trigger for Jesus to go, yup, this is done, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And that's really important. And then of course, we find out as a result of Philip's rather crass question, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. We find out two things. We find out that life with the apostles, with Jesus, wasn't always hunky-dory. There was obviously some dissatisfaction, some confusion, uh, and Philip gives voice to that. Um, but also we find out that Jesus very clearly says, the Father and I are one. This is something that is a theme throughout John's Gospel. I am unable to do anything without my Father. The Father and I are one. So it's really important about the relationship between Jesus and God. So all we are called to do as disciples of Jesus these days is to understand that truth. Understand that Jesus and God are one. That God will be what God will be. And we can only try and do our best to follow. Great saints tried to follow without necessarily truly understanding uh, what the nature of Jesus and the nature of God is. And that is our call as Christians, to follow without that deep, confident understanding of who and what Jesus is. And that's called faith. And faith is really important. So I pray that in the midst of all the doubt and uncertainty which we are currently surrounded with, all the fear that we are currently surrounded with, the dissatisfaction that permeates some of our lives and parts of all of our lives, that we can see that Jesus and God are one and that they are one for us always. Amen.